But again, good morning. Can you hear me now? We'll start off with me fiddling with this for a second or two. It is good to be here today. I've been very thankful with our denomination, the United Brethren in Christ, in that um, they have given permission for me to not serve in a church. I'm going to fiddle with this again. To not serve in a church, but to be able to be released from that to serve as a chaplain. And I get to serve as a hospice chaplain, which has been just a, a blessing to be able to do that, to be able to walk with individuals and their families as they are at end of life and up until the, the point of, of death. And it is just a, it is really a blessing to see how God moves and works in many different ways, in different circumstances, and through different people, and sometimes in very surprising ways. I often get asked, um, how can you do hospice? It must be so sad. It must be so challenging and tough to do. And I say, well, you know, if you've ever served in pastoral ministry, uh, this is kind of a, a relief in the sense before you annoy too many people, uh, you're not in their lives anymore. So it's a brief time that you get to be with people, but it's a very intense time. And you're able to, to give fully to that person and their family and then they have other resources that they come alongside them and, and, and support them as well. And it really is a, an indicator of how we are the body of Christ. And while each person has an individual role to play, not one particular role is um, enough in and of itself. And so we get to see God working through a multitude of people in, in hospice. I wanted to share with you one hospice story. This was several years ago. I went to visit a lady who was 96 years old. She was bedbound, and she lived with her great-granddaughter. And when I went in to visit her, I, I came in, and there was a chair next to the bed, and I sat down, and we were just having a lovely conversation. And there was nothing about her that gave any indication that there were any type of, of dementia or anything like that. And she was very sharp, it seemed like, particularly don't want to sound ageist, but at 96, she was, seemed to be very well aware of what was happening uh, with current events. She was very, very sharp, or so I thought. And then this 96-year-old lady said she was so sad. And I asked her, why are you sad? And she said, I was thinking about my mother dying. And I said, well, when did your mother die? Four years ago. So I did the math, because I'm very smart, and I thought 96, 95, 94, 93, 92. So she was 92 when her mother died. Well, then I knew she was a little bit confused. So I continued with the visit, and we prayed. And when I left, I, I spoke to the great-granddaughter. And I said, she said her mother died four years ago. And the great-granddaughter said, Oh, yeah, her mom died four years ago. And I said, what? Her mother was 106, but she had her daughter when she was 14. And I did the math again. 92 plus 14, 106. And as I left there, I thought, I wondered if the visit changed after I thought she was confused. I wondered if I came across in any different way, perhaps condescending as she told me other things. But it was a good reminder that, that sometimes we hear things and maybe we should believe them and sometimes we shouldn't because I had another patient that he swore to me he was 204 years old. He was adamant about it. He remembered when Lincoln was president and gave great details about it. And I was pretty sure that wasn't true. But you just sometimes never know when you're speaking with somebody what's true and what's not. And so I want to take you to our lesson today from Matthew chapter 8. I want to read it and then I want to start to unpack it for us. 
When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralyzed and in terrible pain. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Blessed be the word of our Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful Father, we ask you that as we are gathered here in this time and place, that you clear our minds, that you open our hearts, that you help us to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth, that you empower us to believe who you are and what you've done. Enable us to go forth without fear, to be able to serve you, that we might have your eyes to see people as you see them, that we might have your ears to hear them as you hear them, and that we might submit to your will in all things. May you lead, guide, and direct us as we've joined together at this time. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus, who loves us and gave his life for us. Amen. Well, as you see on the, the slide there, is there, a, is there a thing behind me? Is there a picture up there? Oh, over there, okay. Capernaum, that's where this takes place. Now, as a background, when we read a story, it's always good to know a little bit about the background or we may not be able to understand it in its fullest. And so this encounter with Jesus is taking place in Capernaum. But this is part of Israel, and it is occupied by the Romans, the Roman Empire. And one of the reasons that that is so important for the Romans to maintain control of Israel is that is the land route to get to North Africa, Egypt. Egypt was the breadbasket for the Roman Empire. They were dependent upon grain coming from Egypt. And so they could take no chances of losing control of Egypt. And so, of course, you could go through the Mediterranean Sea, but it was very important to be able to control the land routes as well. And Israel was right there, right on the Via Mars, the way of the sea, the path to come down into northern Africa. And so, of course, the Israelites, as most people are, are not keen on having an occupying force take control and so in the story we encounter a centurion a centurion was a roman officer normally in charge of a century of men usually about 80 people at that time usually a military position but could also be used in other positions as well uh, so it was a person that was beginning to gain a lot of respect they had a lot of of power at least on a on a, 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 a local level. So if you were in a community where there were Roman centurions, if you were a Roman citizen, uh, the centurion would have some degree of authority over you. And if you were an Israelite, he would have a lot of authority over you. So centurions were often very much despised and disrespected by uh, the is Israelites. Now, not named, but implied in this story is... is the religious leaders, in particular the Pharisees, who were entrusted to teach people about the ways of God. They did teaching in the synagogues. They were the religious leaders. And their task was to draw people closer 
to God. So that's the setting for the story where we see something taking place. And so I want to go back and look at this first encounter. Now Jesus has entered Capernaum and a centurion came to him asking for help. Now in some ways that's amazing in and of itself that a centurion that would have had access to the best doctors in Capernaum, the Roman doctors that were there, that, that he would have had money, that he would have had access to people with power, that he goes to who? An itinerant Jewish preacher. That's an amazing fact in itself. If you were witnessing that, you would have looked at that and thought, what is going on? Roman centurions did not go up to Israelites and ask for help. But that's what he did. And then look how he addresses Jesus. It's a term of respect. It doesn't necessarily imply divinity, okay? But in this context, it's very much a respectful way to speak to someone, which that would have been very unusual too. But the centurion says, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. You know, it wasn't just the servant who was paralyzed. The centurion who had respect, who had power. In essence, he was paralyzed in that he could do nothing for his servant. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever been in a situation where someone that you love and that you care for, or someone for whom you have responsibility, needs help? And you just can't help them. You know, in hospice, that's one of the things we deal with in almost every circumstance. That a person has a loved one, and they want to be able to help them. They want their loved one to get well, and they can't do it. When I was serving as a chaplain at, at Meadow Haven some years ago, we had a woman who came, and she was so sad because she had just brought her father to Meadow Haven for skilled nursing. He'd had a quintuple bypass. And she said, Adam, I feel so guilty that I'm bringing him here. I feel like I should take care of him. And I asked her, I said, well, didn't he just have a heart bypass? And she said, yes. And I said, well, that, you must be pretty tired after doing that. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, you, 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 you performed the bypass on him, right? She said, no. I said, well, you love him? Yes. Well, if you love him, why didn't you do the bypass? Well, I can't do the bypass. I said, exactly. And the kind of care he needs right now, you cannot provide in your home. You just can't do it. No matter what, you don't have the ability to do that. The loving thing is to be able to make sure he gets the best care, the appropriate care he needs. And I asked her, does that make sense? And she said, yes. I said, do you feel any better? She said, no. No. And that's a lot of what ministry is. Maybe you, maybe you start with the intellectual understanding of something, but the emotional feelings, they just don't cooperate all the time. But it was to try to help her understand that, that, that it's okay. Sometimes, you know, we just don't have the power to do what we want to do. And this is what the centurion was facing. No matter how big of a cheese he was in Roman society, at least compared to where Israelites stood, he didn't have the power to do anything. And so he goes to Jesus to ask for help. I don't think I can ask this in the second service because people are too young. But do you remember before we had GPS on our phones and you'd have to use a road map? I'm going to be very sexist here because I guess this is going on the internet, so it might come back and haunt me in 20 years, but who cares? Remember, I want to ask the ladies, do you ever remember traveling with your husband and you got lost and you wanted to, him to stop and ask for directions? <laughs> Did they ever say, gee, that's the best idea. I need to go in there and tell people I'm totally lost and don't know what to do. I can't wait to stop. Or do they just keep trying to go on for a while? Yeah, until you get more lost. 
That's how I was. A little bit lost, you don't stop. You have to get really lost. Yeah. So you can't imagine in some ways how hard this must have been for the centurion. But he does it. And Jesus says to him, shall I come and heal him? And I think, what a wonderful response by Jesus. So many times I've heard people say, I, I can't go to God. I'm just so, I'm, I'm, I, I got to fix things in my life. I'm not worthy to ask God of, of anything. And here we see this centurion is just ready to go and he's ready to ask. You know, John must be really good at this. Is he strong? I had to push that six times to get that slide to change. We'll see how strong he is when he comes back. <laughs> I think he might be tired. He might be pretty ready to come back. I love the centurion's response, though. When Jesus says, shall I come? Shall I come to your house? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. It's kind of a reversal where most Romans would have looked at the Jewish people and said, you don't belong in my house. You don't belong there. But the centurion says, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. What a statement of faith that this centurion has. To be able to look at Jesus and to be able to pour his heart out and just say, say the word and my servant will be healed. It really makes us think, how much faith do we have in the Lord to be able to do things? Do we ever think something too big or too powerful for God to handle? Or do we think it's too small and unimportant for the Lord to handle? Jesus has offered to come to his house. Centurion says, no, I'm not worthy to have you in my home, but I know you have the power. If you just speak, my servant will be healed. And he speaks from some knowledge of how that works because he says, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And if I tell this one to go, he goes. And that one to come, he comes. If I say to my servant, do this, he does it. See, the centurion understands that when someone has authority and they speak, that command is to be obeyed. The centurion is, a rec is recognizing that Jesus has incredible power, but in addition to that, he has authority. And that is an amazing thing to think about. When we think about the Lord speaking, let's look at the first verse in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God said, God spoke, let there be light. And what? There was light. So from the very beginning, the power of God is demonstrated simply through Him speaking. And that just continues throughout Revelation, to Revelation. But we see Jesus doing the same thing. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, silence be still. Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Again, 
Jesus speaks and incredible things happen. Now think about in the garden, Jesus is about to be arrested. Now you want to talk about being afraid of Jesus. When the temple guards and the soldiers are sent out, they don't know the exact number, but it falls somewhere between 800 and 1,000 armed men. That's what they sent to get Jesus. Now there might be some reasons for that, uh, afraid that, that, that his followers will, will attack them. But 800 to 1,000 men. And when they come up and ask Jesus who he is, he says, I am he. And again, Jesus said, I am he. And they all drew back and what? Fell to the ground. The power of the words of Jesus. The power of the words of God. So here we have the centurion. That is something just so out of character for a Roman centurion saying, just speak and I know my servant will be healed. It says that Jesus was amazed and he turned to those following him and he said, now sometimes words are hard to hear. They're very hard to hear. Have anybody out there, has anybody ever said something to you and it was hurtful? But it was true. That's hard to hear. And a normal reaction for many people is when we hear that, we become angry. And maybe that anger turns to vindictiveness and a desire to what? Silence the person that said what they've said or to hurt them in some way. But here's what Jesus says. When a Roman centurion has come to him and demonstrated this high level of faith, he says, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. Now, who do you think that might hurt the most? Religious leaders that are responsible and called positionally to what? Demonstrate God's faith. I think there's a message there for us that whenever we take on the label and say, I am a Christian, now there comes great responsibility with that. Because people don't necessarily look to the Lord. They're looking at what we do or fail to do or what we say or what we fail to say. Now, Jesus is giving hard words here. I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. So that's hurtful. But now he goes on and says something else. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and feast in the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine? You know what? You're not, you're not good enough right now. But those people that you look down on, they are. Man, they're hard words to hear if you're in that crowd. And he goes on, but many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When we hear something like this, we can have a couple of responses. One is we can just ignore it. The other is we can become very angry and we don't like that and don't want to hear it and maybe don't believe it, so we want to silence it. Or the third option is maybe we can respond to it appropriately so that we're not in that situation. I certainly don't have any insight on any of you on your personal lives or what's going on just a guest person that came in. And, but I bet we've all struggled at times with our faith. I bet we've all struggled at times with behaving in a way that is pleasing to God. And I bet along the way we may have hurt some people because of our actions, our inactions, or because of our words, or our lack of words. And so Jesus was giving this warning to the people. Well, what's that have to do with us today? What do we do with that? 
I want to share another hospice story. And I'm trying to think of when I was here last if I shared this story, and I can't remember if I did or not. But you don't have to answer this, but how many of you remember every word I said the last time I was here? Whew, what a relief. Now I'm going to tell that story. <laughs> this was several years ago. Now, I have permission to share this story, the first half from the hospice patient who was alive to, to say I could share this part, and then the, the, the part following after her death from family. But I still like to change the name. So, but I have a habit when I change the name. I forget the name I use, so I keep changing the name during the story. So the name's going to be Ricky, okay? So if I start using other names, you can put your hand up and let me know I'm going off the rails on my story. But I remember getting called to see Ricky. Ricky was in her 50s. The background, uh, she was best described as someone that suffered broken relationships. Uh, she was divorced and had two adult children with whom her relationship was broken, and she very rarely saw them. Uh, she had fallen out with her siblings and both of her parents, and while they had been estranged, her, her father died, and they never resolved that relationship. But then she got a diagnosis of cancer. And she continued to live in an apartment and work, but then she began to fall as it started to affect major organ systems. And, and eventually she couldn't live on her own. And her mother said, Ricky, come and live with me. And so eventually then she started hospice care. And at that time, the, the uh, living room was converted into her bedroom. There was a hospital bed in there and the oxygenator and everything that she would need. And she came on hospice care and she said, no, she didn't want chaplain services. But chaplain's not just for the patient. It's also for the family. So her mother did want that. So I went to visit, and I was visiting with the mother in the kitchen. Now, you only had to walk a couple steps, and then that was the doorway that led into, with no door or anything, led into the, the, the uh, living room where the patient had her bedroom there. And we're talking, and the mother says, I think you need to go talk to Ricky. Hey, Ricky, chaplain's going to come in and talk to you. And I hear, okay. It's just a great way to start a chaplain visit. You, you know, so warm and loving. You know, they can't wait to see you when you turn that corner. And I walk in, and there's a huge big screen TV up, and there's a NASCAR race on, and there's all kinds of NASCAR paraphernalia in there. That I know it wasn't in there before Ricky moved in. And it was all Daryl Elliott. I mean, Dale Earnhardt, excuse me. Do you guys know Daryl Elliott? He's a U retired UB pastor. I always make that mistake. Always, and I'm a UB church. I just think UB all the time. So it was Dale Earnhardt all over the place. So I walked in. Ricky's kind of giving me the evil eye. I can tell she doesn't want me there. And I, I look at the TV, the NASCAR race on, and I see all the... Dale Earnhardt stuff, and I looked at her and I said, so you like NASCAR? She said, yeah. I said, you look like a Jeff Gordon fan. And if you know anything about NASCAR, Earnhardt fans do not like Jeff Gordon. She looked at me, and then she sort of smiled a little bit, knew I was messing with her. And so we talked for a while. We didn't say one thing about God, nothing about the Bible, I don't think I even prayed with her that day. We just kind of got to know each other a little bit, and she said I could come back. And so I'm not a NASCAR fan, but I had to, for the next time, I brushed up on NASCAR a little bit because it was about what she wanted, so we went in there and we talked, and I made fun of her some more. And uh, slowly the relationship began to develop, but she was getting worse. And then eventually she let me pray for her, and then she let me read scripture. And on one of the visits, she asked me what I really thought about religion. And I shared with her then because she had opened the door. She asked what I thought. And I described about her relationship with Christ. And she's like, okay. So I prayed for her. Then eventually on a visit, she said, you know, my brother was here and she brought my pastor and I prayed to ask Jesus into my heart. And that was so sweet. And then I visited her some more. And one day she was getting worse and worse. And she said, Adam, you know, 
I hate having cancer. I hate it. But I'm thankful for it. She said, you know, before I had cancer, all my relationships were terrible. She said, but now I have a relationship with my mom and my brother and my siblings and my kids visit me now. And she said, even my ex-mother-in-law comes to visit me regularly. And she said, and I also know now where I'm going. It was just beautiful to hear that. She was able to look at that situation and, and see that, that what seemed initially to her like divine retribution, the worst thing that could happen to her, was actually being used to restore these relationships. And the most important one, too, because we talked about how God was going to heal her beyond going back to work. And she said, that's okay. I didn't really like my job that much anyway. <laughs> But the idea that for her, her healing was not an earthly healing in the way we look. It was an eternal healing that had repercussions for all of eternity. And she was able to have that joy. And it was so good to see that. It wasn't too much after that. I, I was in a visit and I got a call. It was from one of our aides that was at Ricky's house and said, I think Ricky just died. Can you come? And so I hurried to get there and I parked. The driveway was full of cars, and I go, and I, by this point, I could just walk in. I walked in, and the aide came over to me and said, I'm pretty sure Ricky died. The nurse didn't get here yet, and he's in hospice. The chaplain doesn't pronounce, you know, or give medication. That's the nurse's job. So I walked in, and I looked down, and R Ricky looked like she had died. And in hospice, you see a lot of people that have died, so you have a pretty good idea. But I wasn't sure, and I bent down almost nose to nose, and I said, Ricky, and her eyes moved just a little bit, and she tried to focus on me. And so I had her mom hold one hand, her oldest brother hold the other hand, and the rest of the family joined around, and we prayed. We prayed, thank you, Lord, that you've come into Ricky's heart, that you love her, that she loves you, and that you're going to heal her, that you're going to take her where she's created to be from the very beginning of time. And there was just this little tear coming down Ricky's face. And then I said, thank you, Lord, for coming to get Ricky. And she took her last breath right at that moment. Now, that sounds like a Hallmark movie, but it actually happened that way. Only time it's ever happened that way, by the way. Just like the only time I've had somebody's mother die when she was 96. That's why I'm telling these stories now. Because I think they really show how God works in surprising ways. But at that moment, while the family was very sad, they were also very happy. Because for Ricky, whose world had gotten smaller and smaller and smaller, she had healing. Her earthly relationships were healed. And now she was in a place free of pain, free of suffering. And they could celebrate that. In this case, we see Jesus heals. Heals the servant. But what we're told is these miracles that Jesus do, uh, did were not something that's promised to everybody that that's going to happen. They were to show the power in the authority of Jesus, which takes us to a higher level of healing. That he has the ability to forgive our sins and open up the door for divine, eternal healing. And so we get to celebrate as we follow Jesus that we have that divine healing that's not restricted to our bodies, but is, is expanded to being with the Lord forever. And that's one of the things that we learn in hospice over and over. Sometimes the best healings that take place happen at the moment of death. Well, there's a lot more that could be said, but remember this. We're called to be followers of God, his ambassadors here on earth. We're called to see people as God sees them, to hear them as God hears them, but to spread the message of truth, which is God is offering an eternal healing. It's not restricted to our bodies in this world, but it's to heal us for all of eternity. 
I can't think of a greater message that we have to share with others. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful Father, we thank You that You have called us and redeemed us and now given us a task which is to love You and to love our neighbors. Father, help us to love our neighbors in the appropriate ways. Not how we think they should be loved or or to meet the needs that we think they have, but help us to understand and listen to Your God so that we meet their needs and we love them in the way that you guide us to do so. Father, thank you for each and every person that's here sitting in the pews. Thank you for the folks that are watching online. We know you love us. We know you guide us. And thank you that you call us by name. But most of all, Father, we thank you that that love of Jesus was demonstrated by his willingness as the Spirit reveals to us to leave heaven where there were shouts of holy, holy, holy and come to earth and hear shouts of crucify, crucify, crucify because He loves us so much and desires for us to be with Him for all eternity. We thank You for that demonstration of love. We thank You in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.